So by working together, um, the projects can make a difference. They can influence the market, can change policy, bring down costs, um, increase green hydrogen availability and production. This is an overview of what NWE has financed um, in the current program. So you'll see we have two main, main um, types of projects. We have the projects that are looking at um, transportation and then the projects looking at facilitating uptake of technologies. Um, this represents um, this is a total of 65 partners representing 49 million euros, which is uh, 28 million ERDF. Um, and these projects have been working to influence the market and to prove the viability of hydrogen in Europe. Um, you can find more information about the projects on our website. Next. Here are some, um, some concrete examples of the projects um, from top left to right. Uh, we have um, the first hydrogen garbage truck in Dusseldorf. I think it was Dusseldorf. Yeah, in December, 2020 from the Hector project. Next, we have the GenCom project, which has worked to influence policy and they managed to get um, hydrogen bus testing in Belfast. Uh, next, we have the hydrogen garbage truck, uh, the hydrogen um, long haul truck um, from H to Share, which um, was one of the first, which is the first um, hydrogen truck manufactured in the Benelux region. So they've tested the truck in the Netherlands, Germany, Belgium, and France, and they've also been uh, central to development, further development of heavy duty trucks in Europe. Um, and finally, we have an example from Scotland. This is the ITEG project, which is using a tidal turbine to produce clean energy that will be hooked up to the grid to create, um, to, to make clean hydrogen. So those are four very different examples of what, what's been done. Um, here we have the policy framework that the hydrogen projects fit in. Um, I won't go into detail here, but you'll see that, um, that the projects, that hydrogen fits squarely within um, EU framework and also future policy that, um, that, um, that, well, hydrogen is clearly in future policy, the Green Deal, and will be even more important. Here we have a good example of, um, of influencing policy through cooperation. This is once again, the GenCom project. Um, they've worked a lot on lobbying and they've had a series of webinars, which I highly recommend they're available online, um, discussing hydrogen and the future. Um, as you can see, they, they've had a lot of influence in Ireland and Northern Ireland. Um, they've produced a lot of, a lot of papers white papers, um, a lot of research, and they've had a big impact. And uh, Paul McCormick will also be leading one of the roundtables later, so he'll be able to fill you in more, I think. Um, and next, this is an example of a market influence through cooperation. This is the H to Share project, which participated in um, a joint call for the development of hydrogen fuel cell trucks in March, 2020, which was organized by Hydrogen Europe. Um, this has led to over 60, um, 60 uh, partners signing an agreement to get um, committing to getting hydrogen trucks on the road by 2030. Um, WaterStuffNet is the lead partner for h to share and um, they've been working with manufacturers, with big auto manufacturers actually to, to really change um, the market for heavy duty trucks in Europe. Um, finally, so we will be hearing from our two projects. Uh, we'll be hearing from Hector and from H2 Ships. Both are working with, um, with transportation, but Hector is more focused on the rollout and the uptake, whereas um, H2 Ships is working with the industry and still in the testing phase. So they'll have two complementary um, views of, of, um, of what's going on now in Europe. So I will stop sharing my screen now. And Amy, Perry from uh, Aberdeen City Council, it's up to you. Okay, thank you, Rebecca. I'll just um, share my screen. 
Yeah, so I'm the project manager for the Hector project. So we are looking at deploying seven different types of um, seven different types of fuel cell waste trucks across seven pilot sites um, in five countries across the Northwest Europe region. Um, so the pilot sites will test the range of uh, real life operational conditions and different truck configurations, um, including both city centre and rural uh, municipal waste collection routes urban paper recycling routes, industrial waste collection routes from private customers. And we're also testing a, a lot, uh, range of different um, truck types. So we're looking at a compressor truck, container trucks, front loaders, back loaders, and one with a lifting crane. Um, Aberdeen City Council is the lead partner for Hector. And projects like this have really been key to enabling um, Aberdeen City itself to make the move from vehicle pilot projects to large scale green hydrogen production. Um, and actually that's what I'm going to talk about today rather than um, delving into the Hector project. So Aberdeen is a center of excellence for hydrogen and fuel cell technologies. Um, and we've be del been delivering hydrogen projects on the ground since 2015. We've used um, an, a range of different funding uh, sources, uh, European, UK, Scottish government funding, which really makes any investment that the council the council itself makes go much further and has helped us to build the, the demand in the city. So it all started in 2014 with the Aberdeen Hydrogen Bus Project, which was funded through a, a mix of FCHGU, Scottish Government, UK public and private funding. And this project really enabled the city to build its first um, infrastructure, so its first hydrogen refueling station. Um, this was primarily built to, to refuel the, the 10 buses but it then also allowed us to go further. We ended up upgrading it and, it, and it, we were able to deploy other vehicles such as cars and vans to use it. So the project achieved over 2 million passengers um, or 2, men, 2 million passengers were transported over 1.1 million miles throughout the project lifetime. And the buses saved over about 100 tonnes of CO2 compared to Euro 6 vehicles. And following the end of the, the pilot project or the demonstration project, we explored options for use of the buses beyond their lifetime. And now um, most of them have been gifted to technical colleges to carry on um, the learning um, to enable the training of the next generation of mechanics and technicians. We now have over 65 vehicles in the city. Um, there have been some delays due to COVID um, as we're all experiencing. We should be up to about 85 by now. But we are expanding the fleet all the time and we've recently welcomed the world's first deployment of 15 double-decker um, fuel cell buses through the FCHU Jive project. Um, and this year we'll also increase the fleet further by um, introducing a number of hydrogen electric cargo bikes. Um, this is being delivered through the Northwest Europe fuel cell cargo pedelec project. And also what we believe is the world's first fuel cell, not the, the UK's first fuel cell electric, electric waste truck um, through the Hector project. So that's due to be delivered next month. Aberdeen was also one of the first in the UK um, for deploying fuel cell electric vehicles in the city's car club. And that was over five years ago. Um, and through the Hightrek 2 project, which is North Sea region, we have continued to roll out hydrogen vehicles in the car club and um, it's now the largest hydrogen car club in the UK. Um, as a city council, we're really actively engaged in encouraging other organisations to adopt hydrogen vehicles um, across our region. We're trying to adopt now a more regional approach. Um, and we recently undertook a fleet study through the Smart Highwear project, um, which reviewed the suitability of 12 um, public sector fleets for conversion to fuel cell vehicles. And we're now following up the next stages of that, of that, um, of that review. But working in partnerships across um, the UK and Europe, including SHEU, Interreg North Sea Region, Northwest Europe, has really allowed the city to deliver a really diverse hydrogen fleet and build our initial infrastructure. So we've now got two re hydrogen refueling stations in the city. And without the support and partnership working that, that Rebecca mentioned, we wouldn't be really be in the position that we are today. 
Um, and the City Council's just approved plans for uh, another order of 10 more double-decker buses um, through FCHU Jive 2 and Scottish Government funding and they are due to arrive in the city in 2022. Um, so throughout our H2 journey so far we've learnt um, a number of lessons. Uh, the most important one is that the price per kilogram of hydrogen is, is really key to unlocking the market and reducing cost um, it, we think can be done by, by unlocking the large renewable sources and increasing demand with a more joined up thinking approach, a more regional approach to bring about um, price parity with diesel or even less if we're, if we're lucky. Um, and the real reality for Aberdeen City is that we're going to run out of hydrogen in the region within the next couple of years with the additional vehicles that we're anticipating. And there, there is the opportunity for energy transition as part of the wider Scottish Government and carbon reduction targets. And that's we, why we're proposing the, the Aberdeen Hydrogen Hub. The aim is to achieve a cost-effective supply of green hydrogen, which will be made available on a commercial basis to the market um, and to support the existing hydrogen projects. We want to make use of the region's renewable resources by building demand um, which we're starting initially with the transportation um, by purchasing the additional buses and then looking at later phases, um, exploring hydrogen for rail, marine and heat, which will then help build up scale and hopefully bring down the price in the long run of hydrogen. And with that demand and supply built up, we intend to enter into the hydrogen export market. So we can produce at scale. It's really a natural transition um, from the oil and gas into hydrogen gas handling. The northeast of Scotland really has a, a lot of renewable experience already, making hydrogen a really um, important and good opportunity for the city and region. At the moment, we're looking for partners to help us develop this um, hydrogen hub uh, vision. And uh, we're working on the procurement process at the moment, so that will be coming out, out very soon to the market. So this is just the last slide um, as a bit of an illustration of our timeline of progress. Um, so we've initially utilised the external and European funding to, to develop the initial sort of pilot demonstration phases, um, building up the base demands and the infrastructure. Um, over the years, we've been building, continuing to build up the demand through, primarily through the council fleet and publicly owned vehicles. Um, for example, the car clubs, and then we built a second station in 2017. And then in 2020, we launched the, the double-decker buses, um, and like I said, with another further 10 coming in 22. So this is just continuing to build up the base demand. And now it's allowing us to move towards looking at other innovative ways, uses of hydrogen, and moving towards that commercial case for supply of green hydrogen. So we still think it's necessary for the council to actively engage in vehicle deployments at the moment because um, we can guarantee that demand for any commercial um, partner. Um, so it builds the base demand and as the hydrogen sector develops further, it's then anticipated that this, the private demand will increase over time. And then eventually the council's role as an early, early enabler will finally diminish. Um, so thank you for listening. Apologies about the technical glitch. <laughs> um, and I think there will be questions later. Is that right, Rebecca? Yeah, thanks a lot, Amy. Um, so oh. yes, we're we're getting some we're getting some questions already in the chat. Please don't forget to um, to put your questions in. We'll answer them after our next presentation. Um, uh, yeah, so Christian Christian Frederic uh, from IFER, who's the project coordinator for the H2 Ships project. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for the introduction, Rebecca, and for this uh, opportunity to say a few words about the H2 Ships project. Um, so, um, in terms of pictures, I don't have so many real, real pictures to show um, as for the um, for the Hector project in the Aberdeen City Council. As Rebecca mentioned, H2 SIPS is a little bit more um, in a, let's say, lower technology readiness level phase for the ships, but uh, nevertheless very challenging. The um, uh, topic behind H2 SIPS is to um, address the question of the energy transition of inland and short sea shipping. 
Um, this is um, quite specific compared to other transport sectors, um, and um, it comes both with, um, let's say, opportunities and challenges. Water transport, when it comes to the um, energy transition, is seen as a very efficient way to reduce um, energy consumption and so uh, also greenhouse gas emissions because it's very efficient, especially when you want to move heavy goods. But on the other side, it's um, one of the sectors which is um, less flexible, I would say, for instance, compared to road transport, because when you build a ship, when you invest in a ship, it's for uh, 30 years at least. So um, the flexibility is not, uh, is not quite there compared to, uh, well, people buying electric cars and uh, which could uh, shift to hydrogen cars within a couple of years. Um, that's why it's specifically um, important, I think, to support the industry uh, by um, bringing confidence that we are not only bringing technical solutions for the ships themselves, but also uh, working on the complete supply chain. Um, and the whole thing is particularly relevant for the Northwest Europe region um, for two reasons. One <clears throat> is it's uh, the region in uh, Europe, obviously, where there's a specifically high density of both maritime ports and also inland waterways. And secondly, it's also a um, very densely populated region, um, which um, makes it even more important to address not only the greenhouse gas emissions of shipping, but also the problem of local air pollution, uh, which with the uh, ships running almost exclusively on, on diesel is um, a very significant issue that can be seen. Um, there, are, there are many news lately around uh, problems with ports and, and the pollution from ships. So that needs to be addressed too. And hydrogen is definitely a very good solution for at least a, a good proportion, a good part of, uh, of the shipping sector. Within H2 Ships, um, we want to um, well do our share of this uh, work for the energy transition of shipping in two ways. The first one is to showcase some solutions. Um, the picture you've, you've seen on the first slide was the, uh, pro the ship which is going to be built at the port of Amsterdam, um, which is going to be a fully zero emission ship. And in the port of Ostend, we're focusing more on the um, supply chain and will uh, develop a floating bunkering infrastructure for green hydrogen. Um, Further to these um, pilot sites and, and just, uh, showcasing activities, we also want to um, more generally support the industry by providing insights into not only the technical solutions, but also um, what will make these solutions work? How can we build economically viable ecosystems? So business scenarios, uh, regulation and uh, coordination between the stakeholders are also a key um, aspect in our project. At this point, I'd like just to, to um, for those who are not familiar with the um, shipping world, um, just to mention that uh, actually putting a fuel cell on a ship is not something completely new. It has already been, been done um, 20 years ago, if not more, um, successfully. Um, ships have been operated without any issues, but um, in several of these projects uh, in Europe, um, the, um, the, the nice demonstration has come to an end. Um, due to the lack of um, viable uh, business model. And that's what we want to avoid now. That's, I think, what we need to demonstrate today. Um, quite a challenge, but uh, there's uh, something to be done. H2 Ships is um, about at midterm now. We've been uh, working for, for two years and there's uh, one and a half and two years ahead of us. And the main result we have achieved now um, is the confirmation that we can build the ship we want to build in Amsterdam. That may seem a little bit contradictory with uh, what I said just before, but that's because um, the ship we want to build in Amsterdam is not a, a normal hydrogen ship um, because it will include an innovative storage system. Um, namely metal hydrides, which allows to get rid of the issues with a, a high pressure and uh, um, difficulties with safeties for the bunkering of the ship. And the confirmation of the feasibility of this project um, might seem a little thing or something obvious, but it's a big step for us because it seems it means first that we can launch the construction of the ship in Amsterdam. 
and but also because it has triggered some additional benefits um, namely this um, successful design phase has increased the interest of industrial partners around that project and um, based on this positive result the uh, partners involved in nature ships on this development have been able to create a new consortium with industrial partners which aims at further developing this new technology and especially looking at the uh, regeneration of uh, the metal hydrides. That's for those who are interested in the, the technology. Obviously, by the end of the project, we want to have uh, finished the construction and demonstrated the operation of that ship. Same thing for the floating burn crewing station in Ostend. What I'd like to mention here is that we have a third port involved in, in that project um, where we are work, working a little bit more on the uh, development of a complete ecosystem and looking at how could we plan um, the construction of um, a production plant dedicated to the ships, associated distribution uh, network for the ships. Um, and that we do uh, with um, the help of our industrial associated partners involved in, uh, in, in this activity. And similarly, at uh, European level, we also want to uh, end up with the complete roadmap, which will also include um, the economic aspect, the regulation, and the, uh, the uh, necessary networking between the stakeholders who want to, uh, to move forward with hydrogen for the ships. Um, since we started the project two years ago. We've seen many other activities, many other initiatives being started. Um, that can be a little bit uh, disturbing at the beginning, but um, eventually I think it's a big chance and a very positive sign. Um, and when we uh, think a little bit, it's clear that we will not by ourselves start the uh, development of a green hydrogen network in Europe, um, this needs to be started at many places um, in parallel um, uh, until, until the point where we have a sufficient density of uh, production and bunkering stations to allow the industry to fully um, go from diesel to uh, alternative fuels. So that's a very, very encouraging sign, I think, that uh, there are many other projects on the same topic. Thank you very much. Um, I think this is your last slide. Um, yeah, la last but one. Um, okay, because we have 13 minutes left and we still have questions. We have a lot of questions coming in. Yeah. And, um, so I, I, can, I can stop there. I mean, uh, some, some bullet points have already been addressed. But, okay. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Projects for future ships in Paris. So yeah. I'll let you with this. Okay, thank you very much. Um, the presentations will be available online. Um, this is being recorded, so you'll receive the links to all this. So you'll see the presentations and you'll be able to listen to this again and get in, in contact with our speakers if you would like to. Um, we have been getting a lot of questions which we'll deal with after the presentation on the future. Um, so Elizabeth, if you're ready. Hello everyone. <laughs> Good morning, I'm Elisabeth Bauschbun. I'm a German contact point. And I will try to give you a quick overview of uh, how hydrogen is uh, going to be dealt with in the future program. As we have heard before, hydrogen is a key instrument for meeting the Green Deal objectives in the EU. And this is why we're also focusing on this. And also because we have certain territorial challenges in North West Europe. As we have heard in the plenary today, it's one of the highest energy consuming regions in Europe, but there's still unexploited potential for um, improving renewable energy production and consumption mix. But we also have, um, yeah, these potentials are limited due to lack of certainty regarding future investments, but also um, the persistence of uh, legal barriers, for example. So, um, yeah, how to exploit the potential for green uh, hydrogen in Northwest Europe and how to make it more com competitive and widely available in the region. These are the questions we are um, looking at in the future program. And the good thing is that, um, as you heard today, we had the stakeholder consultation and stakeholders see great potential um, for Interreg Northwest Europe program to tackle these um, challenges. Also because the challenges are similar in, in the regions. And um, so, yeah, it's always too complex to, to work on it um, alone as a country or a single company. This is why the program will prioritize on smart and just energy transition and also promoting renewable energy, which will be where you have to look at when you look for hydrogen in the future program. 
So what are the types of activities we're looking at um, in the future? Uh, I only have five minutes. This is why I'm a little bit quick. <laughs> so what I recommend is to read the program as soon as it's ready. Um, yeah, we're looking for joint strategies, not only to elaborate them together, but also to implement them together. Um, so to, yeah, um, implement a re um, renewable energies in your region. Pilot actions will still be possible, but we have a little different focus. So we don't want to have the demo phase, but we want these tools and solutions to be taken up in the regions. And these can be for different sectors, for transport, for example, for shipping, as we heard before, but also for different types of regions. So in urban regions and peri-urban regions and um, rural regions as well. So these are things we want. And what's also new is we want capacity building and awareness rising in the public. Um, and as you know, always involve the different stakeholders as has been done before to have uh, the greatest impact you can have. And uh, yeah, then we come to the, to the impacts that, um, that, that we want to see and that we need to see if we want to exploit the potentials to improve the renewable energy production and consumption mix in Northwest Europe. We want energy transition to be embedded into territorial strategies and local initiatives. And we want, as I said before, innovative technology solutions and products um, to be taken up. And um, yeah, what's important is to ensure coherence between your approaches and local and regional needs. And um, yeah, that everyone, citizens, consumers, local com um, communities and businesses um, are yeah, involved in energy transition. This is more or less what I can say at the moment. <laughs> I'm going back. <laughs> Um, because the program is still drafted, we want it to be approved by the Commission at the end of 2021 so that we can expect first calls in 2022. As I said before, if you want to know more, please follow our website. We have a section dedicated to the new program and also follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn as you have done before. And um, I think now we can go for question and answers as I heard. We have a lot for the two projects. Yeah, thanks a lot, Elizabeth. Um, so we've been looking through the questions. Thanks, Olivier, for your work behind the scenes. Nobody can see you, but we know you're there. Um, we've had a lot of questions. A lot of them um, are asking about the cost of infrastructure, the cost, the high cost of green hydrogen. And I think we can all agree that um, through further so for, through thir further financing and support, um, we can bring the cost of green hydrogen down. So I just want to ask a couple of specific questions to our projects. Um, so, sorry, let me find them. First one is for Amy. So what is the infrastructure cost to build hydrogen refueling stations? And there was also a question about where the where is the hydrogen coming from in Aberdeen? Yeah, thanks, Rebecca. So at the moment, um, both our stations are, um, are fueled from green, uh, well, it's a green tariff from grid electricity. Um, but obviously we're hoping, to, and, and that's the greenest we can get at, at the moment. Um, and the cost to build is very much dependent on the size of the station and the technology that you, um, that you use. Um, for example, our smaller station um, is about 130 kilos a day, and it was probably about just over 2 million to build. Um, but it's very much dependent, I guess, a case by case basis almost. Great. Thanks a lot. Um, there are quite a few questions coming in about H to ship. So I, um, Christian Frederic, they're in the, in the chat. Um, I'm trying to find the question that we said that you would talk about. And there's so many of them now that I'm getting a little confused. Uh, do you see any technical solution to the upgrade of existing ships to H2, alternative to fuel cells? And then a question just came in about, um, do you look specifically for short distance ferries as well? And are these activities only focused on implementing higher TRL solutions or are more innovative development projects also possible? <clears throat> um, so many things to say yeah, regarding the first question. Um, yes, um, uh, what I see is that it's really a very much a case by case basis. And obviously due to the long lifetime of the ships, retrofitting needs to be uh, a solution. And um, I think there are many, many solutions and uh, I, no one needs to be dogmatic there. 
uh, of course, you can use uh, dual fuel engines. That may be that, that, that may be the most convenient um, solution for ship owners. Um, there are also possibilities to retrofit ships with the fuel cells. We know a partner project, the Ishi project, uh, in which there's a plan to uh, retrofit an existing barge and put uh, fuel cells uh, in the long run. So um, uh, that's all possible, I would say. Um, the second question was on the um, um, TRL level we are implementing. Within h 2 um, uh, as I mentioned, we are working on an innovative uh, solution for the, uh, for the storage. Um, but um, when it comes to um, developing business models, I think we are really looking at what can be done in the next years. Um, maybe it's worth saying a few words on that. Um, what we've been seeing in Paris since we started working on this is that we have ship owners who are really ready to act quickly. They, they feel a lot of pressure to um, modify the way their fleet is operated and to reduce their emissions locally. And so the challenge is how can we at short term bring green hydrogen? And we believe uh, it's worth looking at the possibility to have a local production because obviously transport costs are both reducing the uh, uh, commercial viability of the system and also the uh, environment, environmental benefits. So we are working actively on trying to uh, propose solutions on where and how we could produce hydrogen locally at a reasonably viable price for the uh, customers, for the industrial customers in Paris and uh, bring that uh, the shortest way possible to the ship. Okay, thank you. And I just realized I forgot to turn off my mic, so I hope you didn't hear me scrolling through all the questions. <laughs> um, um, so we have uh, four minutes left. Um, I'm just scrolling through the questions. Um, there are a couple of interesting comments that I'll just bring up. As with all game-changing innovation, it requires legislative support to pump prime the market. Green H2 requires subvention to get beyond the starting blocks. Without this, we will not achieve net zero by 2050. So that's clear. We need projects. And um, going back to the Franz Timmerman quote from the beginning, we need the right projects to, to reach our goals. Um, Sorry, another question coming in. Uh, are these activities only focused on implementing higher TRL solutions or are more innovative development projects also possible? So this is about the future. Um, we, honestly, we, we don't know yet. Uh, we don't know what kind of activities, I can't confirm specifically which activities will be, um, will be financed. Um, Elizabeth, I don't know if you have anything more concrete to say, but I think it will be, um, from what I've heard, it's, we're looking more at missing links at, um, um, that's where Interreg will be focused at, um, helping to, to get the value chain going, helping to get the market, helping to support the market. Um, I think there will probably be demonstration projects, but I can't confirm anything for sure right now. One of the, another thing that you can do if you're interested in what we financed already and where we're going on our website, we have a repository of the hydrogen projects. Um, and our, you know that our hydrogen project, the projects that we were supporting in hydrogen have, are in close contact and they have worked together. Um, and because, well, you make change when, by cooperation, that's what we're about. And so you can find more information about the specific projects. I can also highly recommend, as I said earlier, the webinars organized by the Gen Com project, um, which are extremely interesting. And they've managed to bring in a, a number of actors throughout the world um, with very interesting examples and discussions. Um, and those are also available via our website. 